Hello, everyone. Okay, so we're back digging into the Ben Bennett case and still finding more and more. Now it's not coincidences. Um, we've discovered that it's actual connections. So we've got Norm gone. He's um, standing in the way in the Ben Bennett case on the DNA evidence. What's he doing in the Avery case? He's standing in the way of us getting a hold of the DNA evidence. So he's playing the same role in both the Ben Bennett case and the Avery case. Look at Michael Camp. He's the head of the Milwaukee Crime Lab, right? He is signing off and putting files, falsifying files in the Bimbenic case, admittedly so. Caught with his pants down, basically, for lack of better words. So Michael Camp then is the one that has allowed his crime lab assistant to sign off on the deviation of Sherry Colhane in the Avery case. And then, let's see, we've got Norm gone. Okay, Ira Robbins brings up that there's a whole cover-up on Ken Kratz. So this is before MAM is even made. And Ira Robbins is explaining that if they're not going to, if they're going to create loopholes and new laws as they need them and then flip them back when they're done, they're acting like gods. Hi, Gloria. Good to see you. Hi, Justin. Justin's my faithful. He always shows up. I appreciate that. He's usually first one in the door. I really appreciate that. I want to bring this up. Um, Justin says, was doing some um, of the blog reading, like following they had a blueprint of what worked once and where yeah I get what you're saying Justin okay so he's saying if you read the Ben Bennett case it's like that's the blueprint and then you can lay that same blueprint with the same architects right over the Avery case I get where Justin's coming from on that and he brings up like the fact that the bullet was never logged out of the crime lab to be retested in Minnesota so I want to jump right into this. Um, uh, that sounds good, Gloria. We'll be here for you. Okay, let's jump right in. So I want to talk about the, the murder weapon in the Ben Bennett case today. So I grabbed part 14. And then we're going to read about, we're going to read about several weapons. Okay. So we'll try to see if we're looking at the on-duty revolver, which would be the one carried while, he, while Schultz was at work as an officer. We're going to read about an off-duty revolver that was supposed to be left at home. And that's where Lori Bimbenik gets accused because she's the only one at home with the off-duty revolver, allegedly. Okay, so here we go. It gets confusing. <laughs> Okay, I feel like the, the guy off of, um, I can't remember, South Park or whatever. Okay, all right, part 14, which gun was it? On May 28, 1981, Christine J. Schultz was murdered by a single gunshot fired from a gun that was in direct contact with her back. That shot caused an imprint on her back similar to a hot iron used on a branded cow. Center photo of Exhibit 14-1. At Lori Bimbenek's trial, the prosecutor claimed that Detective Alfred Schultz's off-duty gun, top photo of Exhibit 14-1, was the murder weapon. Since then, five internationally recognized expert pathologists have determined that Schultz's off-duty did not make the murder wound, but the wound had more likely been caused by a weapon, such as his on-duty gun, Bottom photo of ex, of ex, can't read this morning, exhibit 14-1. Part 7 of this blog spot has already disclosed that unexplained type A blood was found on Schultz's 
on-duty gun and that Christine Schultz had type A blood. So let's go back and let's, we're going to return to this, but we're going to go to part seven because that's the part, it's going to make more sense for us, I believe. So this was recorded Monday, December 13th, 2010. Part seven, what about Schultz's on-duty gun? Okay, so they want us to understand this in a certain order. I'm jumping all over because that's just how I research. But let's follow their thing because they said we would have read this already. Since Lori Bembenek's trial, many questions have been raised about the ballistics evidence. At trial, the prosecutor claimed that Detective Alfred Schultz's off-duty gun was a murder weapon and that Lori was the only person who had access to it at the time of Christine Schultz's murder. Two Wisconsin Crime Laboratory ballistic experts had examined both Detective Schultz's on-duty and off-duty guns and testified that his off-duty gun was the murder, weapon, murder gun. Recent ballistic tests by both Bimbenik's expert and a different state expert failed to match Schultz's off-duty gun to the bullet that had been removed from Christine Schultz's body. Years earlier, five forensic experts specifically stated that Schultz's off-duty gun did not match the wound that was made when the murder gun was placed against Christine's body at the time it was fired. There are many reasons to question the original crime laboratory experts' opinions that the off-duty gun was the murder weapon. 21 days after the murder, Detective Efford Schultz's... Uh, the, let me start over. I'm still not feeling it, y'all. I'm still kind of sick. 21 days after the murder, Detective Elford Schultz delivered two guns to other detectives who turned them both into the crime laboratory. He claimed that one was his off-duty gun and the other was his on-duty gun. There's evidence to suggest that he had at least one additional gun that he did not submit for examination. At the crime laboratory, those same experts found unexplained blood on the muzzle of his on-duty gun, which was consistent with a gun being placed against a body when fired. Further tests were conducted, and the blood was determined to be a Type A Exhibit 7-1, when Christine Schultz's blood was determined to be Type A Exhibit 7-2. Schultz could not give reason for the blood on his on-duty gun. Police conducted no further investigation into the matter. All right, so Exhibit 7-1 shows in paragraph 25, examination of a Smith & Wesson 38 Special Item BF revealed the presence of human blood. Serologically or logical typing of the, of the above-cited blood strain, strain, I can't read today, serologically typing of the above-cited blood staining indicated same to be of the international blood group A. Then we come down to Exhibit 7-2. We have the items as through BA were reportedly recovered from the police academy. In the first paragraph, indirect typing examinations of a blood sample reportedly from Christine Schultz, item M, revealed same to be of the international blood group A. So let's recap this. Basically, Detective Schultz's on-duty gun has actual human blood on the barrel consistent with blowback from a gun being placed on a body. We have experts that say that it would match the marking and they don't do any further investigating. Hmm. Because they're targeting one individual. One individual. They are tunnel vision. They're going to take Lori Bimbenek down. And what do we have in the Avery case, you guys? Tunnel vision again. And it just, it breaks your heart to know that these individuals are innocent. Both of them. Lori and Stephen and Brendan are all innocent 100%, and this is what they do. We have, in the Bambinic case, we have blood on the barrel that is human, that matches the victim on the ex-husband's weapon, his on-duty revolver. 
and he's supposed to be on duty when it happens. Hi, Eddie. How are you? Good morning to you. Hi, Kelly. So blowback from the gun is ignored in the police investigation. Seriously, she says. Yes, Kelly. Truthfully. Yeah, I am feeling a little better. I'm going back to work today. Thank you, Super Mario. I like your name. Super Mario Maker 2 Glitch Hunters. It is a deliberate frame job, Kelly. I totally agree it sounds like one. Um, so if that's his on-duty revolver, is showing that it's got blood, human blood on the barrel that matches the same blood type as his ex-wife, and you look at that, and he should be prime suspect, and instead they turn him into a star witness. And what do we have with Ryan Hillegas? With Ryan Hillegas, he should be the prime suspect, right? But he, he's not. He's put in charge of stuff. He's put in charge of the search party and all kinds of stuff. He's treated as, Kratz said, an unofficial law enforcement. He's allowed behind the, the yellow tape, the crime scene tape. And... Remember, it's like right before they find the electronics allegedly in Stevens' burn barrel. Ryan Hillega shows up with Scott Blodorn while everybody's out on Cuss Road checking out the old burial scene. It's just, it kills me. It just kills me. You know, I'm starting to walk this timeline out and it seems to me that if we look at the Avery case... And we just did a, a glance over, okay, just a real quick glance over. Um, it would look like the killer would have originally put that vehicle out there on I-43 and that it got moved as a store facility, if you will, for a few days at Cuss Road until it could get moved on the 5th up onto the Avery property or a duplicate. And in the meantime... I think that left the remnants of what they find when they restage, as that paperwork said, on the back of their login and sh sheets on the restage Cuss Road. I think the 6th and the 7th, they're finding the remnants of whoever did the cleanup and moved it from um, I-47, 147 I mean, onto Cuss Road much earlier. I'd say between the 3rd and the fifth till they could get it up on the Avery property and so when they come back on the sixth or the seventh I think that's when they're basically just finding the remnants of the initial planting and transferring of everything I did find it interesting when I was listening to Mind Shock and they were talking about the pupils um, or pupils or pupils that's it pupils I found that very interesting that it puts the timeline, if you follow the scenario that they were speaking of, um, it would follow the timeline that she would have been burnt after the law enforcement had the Avery property. And I thought their math was done very well. Um, so, Kelly says, Fox guarding the hen house. I agree there. You know, they've got the system planned out. They've got the crime lab doing whatever they want um, falsifying documents obviously can be done because the head of the Milwaukee Crime Lab admittedly does so in a homicide case that convicts someone wrongfully. And she's still wrongfully convicted to this day, even after her death. It's heartbreaking. Where 10 years later, she's still considered a convicted criminal of homicide. And we know she didn't do it. So now what's interesting, we're going to jump off the Lori Benbenek blog site for a minute. I went and did a Wikipedia. Um, actually, a very good friend of mine um, helped me out do, doing this, sent me some links, and that was um, Who Wants Truth. So thank you for that. Murder of Christine Schultz. Now keep in mind, this is where we get to hear about witnesses of the actual um, thing that took place. Of, of Christine Schultz's murder. Witnesses, eyewitnesses, 
and they're completely ignored. So on May 28, 1981, at approximately 2.15 a.m., Fred Schultz's ex-wife, Christine, was murdered in her Milwaukee home. Christine Schultz had been killed by a single 38 caliber pistol shot fired point-blank into her back and through her heart. She had been gagged and blindfolded, and her hands were tied in front of her with a rope. Her two sons, then 7 and 11 years old, found her face down on her bed and bleeding. The older boy, Sean, had seen the assailant and described him as a masked male figure in a green, green army jacket and black shoes. He also said the man had a long, approximately 6 inch or 15 centimeter reddish colored ponytail. Bembenek had dyed blonde hair, weighed 140 pounds, and was 5 foot 10. So, they ignored... Let's jump ahead a little bit. Look at this. Fred Schultz had previously been exonerated in the fatal shooting of a Glendale, Wisconsin police officer on June 23, 1975. The Glendale officer, George Robert Sasson, had arrested a subject in a bar while off-duty. Milwaukee police officers, including Schultz, responded to the call in suburban Glendale outside this, their jurisdiction, reportedly mistook Sasson for a suspect and shot him to death when he turned toward them holding a gun. Schultz and his partner were cleared by the Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office in the shooting. Thanks, Norm Gone, right? Because he's the... um attorney the the assistant district attorney wow guys erg 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 i can't i can't believe this is the way it's been and that we're just now looking into the ben bennett case it's mind-blowing if the locals had not actually brought up the photographs which now there's no way you're going to convince me when we're talking about the same individuals that some of them might not or might be in those pictures. I believe there are. <laughs> in my personal belief, I believe those pictures. I believe the locals. And when you look at the Bembenic case, there is connection. It's not just coincidences. There's nefarious behavior by individuals that run our state crime lab in Milwaukee that then later sign off on the Stephen Avery case. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit the table there. Um, so let's go ahead and dig in a little bit deeper on the other weapon. We'll go back to trying to, to do which gun is it. So now we've heard about the on-duty revolver of Schultz, Edward Schultz, right? or Alfred Schultz. And Alfred Schultz's on-duty weapon has human blood that's type A, and Christine Schultz is type A. Also, it, it shows the, the blowback on the gun that would be consistent to putting the gun to someone. This is his on-duty weapon. Now, the state is doing their lie and their confusion, and they're trying to say that the off-duty weapon was at home, and he didn't have access to it. Only Lori Bembenek did. See, they try to make it very personable to her, right? But it doesn't make the wound that was left on Christine's back. So let's go into part 14 now. We read the top part, and we're going to jump right into. In rebuttal to the five defense pathology experts, Milwaukee County Deputy District Attorney Robert D. Donahoe, obtained a report from a pathologist in Texas who had been reported to have created some, quote, junk science reports on other unrelated cases. That report claimed that Schultz's off-duty gun had made the murder wound on Christine. However, Donahue had never given his pathologist the photos shown in Exhibit 14. Instead, his report revealed that Donahue only gave him a similar gun, not even the murder weapon that the state had in its own custody. Please view Exhibit 14 and decide for yourself which gun caused the wound in Christine Schultz's back. Okay. So on the top, we have Schultz's on-duty 
weapon magnified two times. And then we have contact with the wound. And then on the bottom, we have the off-duty weapon. Oh, please. Okay, first of all, you guys, look at the narrow rim of the off-duty gun. And then look at the width of the off on-duty gun. And then look at the contact wound. I don't even have to be a ballistics expert. I think you could ask a first grader in this picture. Holy crap. You can even see the bruising from the size of the hole. So the size of the hole in the bottom off-duty revolver is quite large compared to the wound, but yet it's small like the on-duty. What do you guys think? Somebody hit me up. I'm just reading. Hey, Jedi Scoops, good to see you. Um, Jedi Scoop says, hi, RD. Oh, gosh, this case was so messed up. Bad, bad, MPD. Oh, my God. Are you guys looking at that? Look at that. Is there any way that anybody can say in their real belief in what they see that the off-duty gun could even come close It's absolutely the on-duty gun. Huh. I'm reading anonymous. Looks like the gun in the top photo matches perfectly. So who did Fred Schultz give his on-duty gun to that night? Would you do that? Would you hand your gun off? There is... There is, um, there's more to this also. Um, I want to go over to a matter of credibility. This is a moment that should never have happened in ever being said in a case. So I'm going to try to dig in here. On November 19, 1981, a month before Ben Benick's trial was to begin, Detective Lieutenants Craig Hastings and James Kelly contacted District Attorney McCann seeking charges against Schultz. Page 5 of their official report states in part, quote, It is our understanding that elements of portions of our investigation have been previously discussed between Mr. McCann and Mr. Kramer, but the Mr. McCann had requested our department not to pursue them until Schultz had testified at the preliminary hearing. And then we could then proceed with his approval. Since the preliminary hearing has already taken place, it is our understanding that this district attorney's office would cooperate with any investigation that we may develop. Upon entering Mr. McCann's office, we advised him that we requested to discuss the Schultz matter and recent developments in our investigation, he stated that he had talked with Mr. Kramer and said to us, do you want Bembenic or do you want Schultz? What? Okay. It's, I, I'm speechless. We're going to come back up. Let's see what you guys think. I'm, I'm absolutely speechless right now. Justin says, um, Ibra also made good point about conflict of interest with AG representing so many different sides at the same time. Yes. Justin says has to be the on duty. I agree. Kelly Perry says Steve Wonder, Stevie Wonder might not be able to see it, but everyone else should be able to tell which gun was a murder weapon. Kim Craig says, I just wonder why are men dancing nude in front of kids most related to each other in crime, all the L.E. E. 
Yeah, Jedi Scoob says this has to be the apex of Milwaukee PD's corruption. Yeah, if Big Brother's behaving this way, what do you think the little counties are behaving right below it? Come on. They did take out Bambi. Oh, my God. Literally. This is... She didn't like to be referred to as Bambi, so I don't like to say it too often, but... They chose to convict a person that they needed to shut up. Remember, this didn't just come out of the blue. There was already a problem going on. So Bambenek had got caught smoking marijuana. And she was being judged for it as a cop. And she had found these pictures and she was saying, well, if they can do all this and these are cops then I want investigation. I think I'm getting treated differently, right? They wanted to stop the investigation into the corruption of these photographs. So in walks this guy named Schultz that happens to be a cop and starts dating her. Now, all of a sudden, we hear stories about, I think her name was Patsy or Posey, or... um. I can't recall. I'm still under the weather here. Um, the friend, Polka. The Polka friend. She was saying that Christina Schultz was terrified of her ex-husband. And there's even question if it, it, at the time if it was her ex. There was some marriage dispute that he, he married Ben Benick and it wasn't even legal. Or something. I don't know. There's something about a marriage we got to dig into. Don't quote me. I may have that off. I haven't read as much. And we have the son of Christine Schultz, who's 11 years old, who says it's a man in army gear, in black shoes, with a mask, and a ponytail. And that doesn't seem to matter. Justin says that is effed up. Jedi Scoop says at Craig, absolutely. Kelly Perry wants to know, do they cut the deck of cards to decide who's in charge? It's a total boys club, Jedi Scoop says. Kelly Perry, you win it. I mean, if there's a way to give you a badge, I would. This is a statement I will fully support. They wanted to silence Ben Benick and they wanted to silence Avery because both individuals were showing corruption being uncovered. And this was all taking place when all the truth came out on the Ben Benick case was a few months before the Avery thing went down. So let's say Halbach went missing, okay? So if you back that up, where does that put us with Avery? He's up on the national news saying he wants an apology. He wants accountability from a corrupt county, right? They felt threatened in the Ben Bennett case. They frame her for murder. What do you think they felt when all of a sudden legislatures were standing up with Stephen? Big time people are starting to get recognition with Stephen and putting their arms around this guy. He's starting to show the nation that there's corruption and they won't repent and they won't take responsibility and they are not going to say they're sorry and they're stubborn. So Stevens pointing it out. He, he basically got silenced and they shut up Bimbenic and they shut up Stephen and they did it the same way. Both of them, it's the crime lab is being used and the DNA evidence is being refuted and held onto and hidden and and all this by Norm Gone in both cases. Yeah, Justin's saying, um, do you want to lose a cop or silence someone bringing corruption to spotlight? Kim Craig says that little boy will never forget who hurt his mama. 
Yeah, that's it. If anybody was going to be the best witness in the world, it is that kid. There is nothing he's going to forget in that moment. He's going to remember every detail. So there's depositions Justin's talking about, not to mention watching dep depositions. It's not looking good for. Yeah, the state level people are in depositions on the Ben Bennett case for the falsified information. Mark Williams is neck deep in it. He's also pocket deep in the Avery case because he's the one pocket dialing Zellner. Kim Craig says, yep, political parties took him out. Super Mario Maker 2 Glitch Hunters says, allegedly the reason Ellie took the panels off in Essay's trailer, the walls, is they think the photos were hidden there. Kelly Perry says, what photos were hidden? I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's any connection at all. Some people say that they um, think Chuck Avery is appearing in some of these photos, but there's no way for me to be able to even allege that because I have no idea exactly what these people look like back in the day to be able to judge. So I can't say whether it's true or not. It's it's at this point, um, there are a lot of similarities of the people in this case, in these photographs. But when you start getting court documents with names locked in, there's no question. There's no question that the, that the, I mean, why wouldn't they be dancing naked on tables and doing weird stuff in front of the kids? They're killing people and they're cops. The moral lines have been crossed here. I mean, how do you go back from what we've, what we've learned that an off-duty weapon doesn't match the entry, the wound on the victim, but the on-duty revolver does? That there's her type of blood is on, the, she matches the type of blood on the specific revolver. That he's on duty. That the kids saw a male leave. Hey, Wynette, good to see you. It really is, it, it's just mind-boggling to think that um, the same individuals are in both of the Avery case and the Ben Bennett case. They're pulling the puppet strings from above. So Norm Gon's got the puppet strings of the DNA. Well, where's the DNA puppets? Where are the DNA puppets, you guys? State crime lab right? Who's in charge of the state crime lab? Michael Camp. Who signs off on the deviation for Culhane so that the murder weapon in the Avery case is submitted with broken rules? Milwaukee Crime Lab. Kim Craig says all the bondage cap. Did they do BDSM? KK was involved. Hey, KK could have been involved at this point. Who knows? I don't trust that man. <laughs> you know, so let's let's continue to read a little bit further here. So, the private investigator Ira B. Robbins and attorney Mar Mary L. Warrer, who have worked decades in Bebenik's behalf, obtained related internal affairs reports in 1991 after a protracted legal battle against the city of Milwaukee. So they fought long and hard to get this paperwork. This is Exhibit 1. This is dated Monday, November 30th, 1981. On Tuesday, November 10th, 1981, we, Detective Lieutenant Craig Hastings and Detective Lieutenant James Kelly were assigned by Deputy Inspector Rudolph Will to conduct a criminal investigation into recent activities of Detective Alfred C. Schultz, Jr. Specifically, we were assigned to investigate any possible criminal violations committed by Detective Schultz. So, should we read this all? I think we should. Number one, in his marriage to Lorenza Bembenic on January 30th, 1981. Number two, in his testimony before the unemployment compensation hearing held on December 10th, 
1981. Number three, in Detective Schultz's testimony at a preliminary hearing held on September 2nd, 1981, regarding the murder of his ex-wife, Christine Schultz, and the arrest of Lorenza Bembenek. And number four, the alleged involvement of Detective Schultz with a picnic sponsored by quote, the Tracks Tavern, in which nudity beauty contests took place. Our investigation into these four areas of possible criminal misconduct follows with the numbers in parentheses indicating that a copy of the material is attached at the end of the report. I'm going to grab a drink. So let's skim through this a little bit. This is all about a marriage. So we're going to skip the marriage part. This is a whole nother rabbit hole. They want him investigated because it appears as though he has married two women at the same time without waiting the um, legal time frame before getting remarried. So that's part of it. But I want to get this part. Monday 30th, 1981, Mr. Kramer replied, that his review of these charges presented several conflicts for him, as much as he is prosecuting Lorenzo Bembetic for murder and is anticipating calling Alfred Schultz as a state's witness, he suggested that we contact District Attorney E. Michael McCain or McCann for further review. On Thursday, November 19, 1981, we proceeded to Mr. Kahn's office and advised him that we would like to review the Schultz matter, which we believed he had prior knowledge of. It is our understanding that elements of portions of our investigation have previously been discussed between Mr. McCann and Mr. Kramer, but that Mr. McCann had requested our department not to pursue them until after Schultz had testified at the preliminary hearing and that we could proceed with this with his approval. This agreement was confirmed in our discussions with Mr. Kramer. Since a preliminary hearing had, had already taken place, it is our understanding that the district attorney's office would cooperate with any investigation that we may develop. Upon entering Mr. McCann's office, we advised him that we requested to discuss the Schultz matter and recent developments in our investigation. He stated that he had talked with Mr. Kramer and said to us, quote, do you want Bembenek or do you want Schultz? Whereupon, Lieutenant Kelly replied, he's violated the law. Mr. McCann then advised us to get an appointment. When we made an appointment to see Mr. McCann at his earliest appointment on Wednesday, November 25th, 1981 at 10.30 a.m. They file a report and they submit it to the uh, assistant district attorney. And it's all about psychological problems that Alfred Schultz had to leave, had to take sick leave. I'm going to let you guys dig into that. I just find it interesting that the cops will not, and even the, the uh, DA, will not investigate this. They won't touch it. The media won't touch it. They're left to do whatever they want. And that's what's happening in the Avery case. Exactly. Perverted police picnic pictures. I love it, Kelly. That's exactly it. Perverted police picnic pictures. Jedi Scoop says, Cops lie and I do not trust the state crime lab. Who's doing the testing? Someone without a degree, Justin points that out. Kim Craig says there's a lot of people covering it up. Like you start looking at it and in the Bembenic case, it was the crime lab itself was falsifying documents and they were being ordered by state and that was used to frame an innocent individual and destroy their lives. And, um, you know, it's it's heart wrenching to see that same pattern, um, basically be stenciled on top of the Avery case and be allowed to continue with the same individuals. 
Kim says it's almost like someone acting like a cry a mob crime family. Jedi Scoop says, where and how would all these departments coordinate their cover-ups? I don't doubt they did, but in the 80s, it's not like they had email cops bars. Yeah, Kelly Perry says, at the time the Bebenic was being framed by L.E. and the D.A. Jeffrey Dahmer was in the middle of a 17th victim crime spree. That right there tells you a lot. If they were doing their job, innocent lives would be protected, which is what they're hired to do. Same in the Avery case. If they had been doing their job, they would have gotten the correct man, Gregory Allen, before the statute ran out, before he was allowed to continue to do crimes against women and assault people. So there's a lot to these cases that run hand in hand, a lot. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to go over. I'm trying to remember which one it was. Was it enough is enough? I don't think it was this one. Let me just check. Yes, it was. Okay, you know who Kim Skorlinski is. He's the DCI agent that takes a lot of the special agent reports that we cannot get any copies of in the Avery case. Every report that Kim Skorlinski has done is just evaporated. It's not something we seem to be able to get our hands on, right? Well, he's in this case too. He's in in this in this write up about this case, I should say. It's got Peg L in it. It's just it's yes. We've got to read this. So let's see how much is he gonna write. Okay. This is the last bit we're gonna do before I go. So I'm gonna jump over real quick and just see what everybody's saying. Kelly Perry says two cops actually owed or allowed Dahmer to take custody of one of his victims who escaped. Good lord. Ugh. At this point, I think they all need to be fired and we need to have a different kind of testing to see if they can be a cop. I mean, something has to give. This This is just nuts. So I'm on part 17A. Enough is enough. On August 3rd, 2008, investigative consultant Ira Robbins hand delivered a letter, Exhibit 17A1, to Wisconsin Attorney General J.B. Van Hollen citing specific criminal acts committed by Department of Justice personnel. That letter notified Van Hollen of three separate long-running cases, including Lori Bembenek, John Maloney, and former Winnebago County District Attorney Joe Palacios, where state officials had committed acts of misconduct in public office by gaining a dishonest advantage over another. I'm going to grab a drink real quick. Robbins notified Van Hollen that his subordinates had false, had placed a false document in a state crime laboratory homicide file, temporarily changed state protocols to obtain false expert testimony, and dismissed the credibility of the state crime laboratory. Robbins attached the necessary proof to his letter. Robbins also advised Van Hollen of some other additional crimes and ethical violations he had uncovered in Bebenik's case the John Maloney case, and in the former Winnebago County District Attorney Joe Palacios case. Robbins provided all of the proof and information necessary to show that Department of Justice officials conspired to deliberately interfere with the administration of justice, to deliberately withheld evidence from defendants that they were required by law to disclose, and covered up additional crimes of Mr. Palacios Robbins told Ben Holland, quote, If you were interested in rooting out the corruption that has been entrenched in the Wisconsin DOJ, and to the degree possible, righting the wrongs perpetrated in the name of justice, I ask that you have a member of your staff that you trust implicitly contact me. On August 11, 2008, Robbins received a response 
to his August 3, 2008 letter from Gregory Weber, director of the Wisconsin Department of Jim Justice Criminal Appeals Unit, stating in part, quote, Attorney General Van Hollen had asked me to respond to your August 3, 2008 letter. In Weber's letter, he made demeaning statements about Robbins, refused to respond to the specific allegations, and attempted to put the blame for the criminal conduct of the Department of Justice on others. He sent copies of his letter, which obviously attempted to cover up the truth, and stopped and stopped Robbins' efforts to seek justice. <coughs> Excuse me. and stop Robin's efforts to seek justice to Van Hollen and other DOJ administrators, Kevin C. Potter, Gary Hamlin, and Michael G. Hmm. My size whiskey? My sick whiskey? <laughs> His business as usual letter clearly shows the willingness of the DOJ of the Department of Justice to commit crimes and ethical violations in order to cover up the truth and the willingness of the Attorney General to cover up those crimes and ethical violations. That conduct must not be condoned or tolerated by anyone. So this was hand-delivered. Um, he gives his credentials and he digs into it. He says in 2005, Michael Kemp, director of the Regional Crime Lab in, Ma in Milwaukee, placed a false document in the homicide file attempting to verify false information that the Milwaukee County District Attorney was stating in court. In a second instance, Mr. Kemp, with the approval of higher-ups in the Division of the Criminal Investigation, changed the protocols regarding gun examinations to allow state experts to testify inconclusive rather than no match on a gun examination. A few days later, the protocols were changed back. Those actions have diminished the credibility of the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. I have attached portions of deposition transitions or transcripts to prove these allegations. During recent hearings in Ms. Bemanek's case, the Attorney General's office represented the state in the criminal case at the same time that it represented the state in the civil case brought by Bemanek, while representing the judge in a writ of supervision rising from Ben Benick's case. During this time, the Attorney General's office also represented the state crime lab. Peg Lautenschlager was the Attorney General. And the corruption did not end at, as the analysis and lab supervisors who perpetuated it changed jobs or retired, or as Assistant Attorney General's and attorney generals came and went. It continues to this day, a foul legacy simmering on the back burner, tended by employees and agents drawn into the mere years ago. Another well-known case is that of John Maloney, a Green Bay police officer convicted of murder, arson, mutilating a corpse in the 1998 death of his estranged wife, Sandy. This was a DCI case and your agents committed the following crimes. Number one, agents Kim Solinsky and Greg Agum withheld evidence and lied to Dr. Gregory Schmunk, the Brown County M.E., to get him to sign a death certificate saying Mrs. Mahoney was murdered. Agent Gregory Agum lied about burn tests in the fire scene report and under oath at trial. Number three. Arson Bureau Chief Carol Kelly lied to cover up Agum's lies. She provided false information to Assistant Attorneys General in order to keep them falsely believing that Agum had told the truth. Over the past 10 years, Agum has received help to stonewall investigation and thereby conceal Agum's perjury at every level of WDOJ. Former Peg, well, former Attorney General, Peg Lautenschlager hired her personal attorney at state expense, Stefan Meyer, to conduct a sham investigation into the investigation of Mr. Mahoney's death. Meyer got crime lab ana analysis to rewrite their reports nine years after the fact, refused to speak with forensic pathologists and other experts who reviewed the case independently, refused, in fact, to look at any of the arson claims and evidence at all, and based his conclusion that Mrs. 
Mahoney was murdered on his own review of autopsy photos that had been illegally withheld from defense. A subsequent application for investigation to WDOJ's Public Intric Integrity Unit caused quite a stir, but was prompted, promptly rejected because Agum, both then retired and reprising his work privately for EFI, was acting as an agent of WDOJ when the conduct complaint occurred. A few days later, during a radio appearance, Peg Lautenschlager told Mr. Mahoney's, Maloney's son that he should request an investigation by the public integrity unit she had founded, which had just turned him down. The cover-up continued after you took office without your knowledge or consent, when State Journal reporter D. Hall continued to push for the issue of documentation of Agam's purported burn test, Agam turned to Arson Bureau Director Kelly, Carolyn Kelly, faxing her, Boss, I need advice fast. Miss Kelly told Miss Hall to come look through the DCI file herself. Miss Hall did so. There was no documentation of the burn tests. Miss Hall later learned from me that Miss Kelly deliberately misrepresented what Miss Hall was seeking, what she found what she did not find, and her reasons for inquiring in emails distributed distributed to her own supervisor and to Assistant Attorney General, who had been involved in stopping Mahoney, Maloney's appellate efforts for years. It should be noted that Assistant I can't even do this, you guys. I'm too sick. You're going to have to do it. Attorney General must receive the truth from DCI and the Crime Lab if they themselves are to seek the truth. So it's going to go into a bunch more here about the um, the ballistics testing, the gun testing, and how there's um, 22 other cases. I mean, you need to read this, you guys. Dig in, please. Uh, let's see. I'm going to get off here because I've got to get ready for work. Um, but we were on part 17A. I know the end was the reading was really rough because my brain is not functioning right. But obviously there's enough to show that Peg L was helping cover up a lot of crap in this case as well as other cases. And here she's the one that told Stephen that she would honestly say in her opinion um, that the counties did nothing wrong. Yeah. And now we've got Cole, her son. Really, we got to start getting on the stuff. So we've got to really know who's coming into office and so forth. Um, let's see. Kim Craig says lie detector them all. Oh God, wouldn't that be great? Malia says she's at work or he's at work, but they cannot listen, but we'll follow the chat. Sounds good. Um, you can catch it later. Somebody let them know that they that person can come back. Well, yeah, you can come back and watch it later. Um, Jedi Scoob says, my retired cop friend says, SA is right where he should be. Proves cops protect cops. Uh, Jedi Scoob says, um, Peg Lonschlager breeds corruption. Rest in peace. Yeah. True. Hey, Lulu, how are you? Good to see you, hon. Kim Craig says, we all see the crime. Why are they keeping a lie going till they all die? Yeah, I mean, are we going to be 10 years after the death of Stephen and Brendan when all this stuff finally comes out? Please. We got to stay on this. We got to get these guys home. We got to show the... We've got to show the transparency of everything that we know. That's the key. We've got to become transparent with our knowledge so that we don't allow this to happen again. One thing we are going to be doing is um, we're going to be adding um, Bembenic files that Ira Robbins has conglomerated um, to our library to help sustain the record um, of everything. So... I feel that that'll be a legacy for the youth going forward. 
and these videos will be um, attached so that they can see the comparisons. I'm also planning on doing an actual movie video like about the actual comparisons of Bimanic and Avery. It, it, it's not even comparisons anymore. It's connections. And that's heartbreaking. But the locals are right. It's right there. There's no denying. They Everybody that doubted the locals needs to apologize because they are right. There is direct connection between the Ben Bennett case and the Avery case. A hundred percent. How much more validated can you get than the names Norm Gone and Peg L and Michael Camp and um, King Kratz's scandal going on and it's all right there. And Mark Williams. These are all names that are participating actively in the Avery case that still are fighting people trying to get Bembenic exonerated in her name. Yeah, I'm wondering now, you know, at what point, at what point do we become some hidden site 20 years down the road that our youth stumble upon and say, wow, if we'd have known this, we would have been able to uh, be wiser. You know, are we doing our job in just promoting this this way? Or shouldn't we be, te what are we supposed to be te teaching our youth? I mean, look at the cops and they're comfortable with this. They're comfortable with us telling our kids that stranger danger includes police officers. I'm, I'm so saddened by this, but it's, it's getting to be truer and truer. Lulu remembers this case from years ago and says that she does deserve justice. Melia says soon this will be taught in police school. Lesson cover up and framing. Save your asses. Yeah, Kelly puts this out there. Almost exactly the same MO between the two cases. Yeah, for real. John Boats, how you doing? John Boats wants to put them through facial recognition. Um, you can go to the Bembenic site. So on this um, video itself or any of the videos we've been doing, you click description of the video and there'll be a link there, John. And you can take that, go right to the Bembenic site and the photographs are on there. I think it's part... It's called part five. Please identify the the people in these pictures. So hopefully, I don't know what to leave on the week. I mean, it's just, it's just heartbreaking that this has happened to a young woman and a disabled child and a poor kid. You didn't know. <laughs> They picked on the, I, I'm just saying, they picked on the minority. That's what they did. They found people, they committed crimes, and then they hid the crimes by, the, the crimes were to serve a purpose when somebody couldn't be blackmailed, it sounded like, right? In the ben ben Bennett case, had something to do with pictures is why she was murdered, maybe, you know? And they need to pin, they need to shut up the other person. So what they do is the, the people threatening the blackmail, maybe, this is all hypothetically, you know how I like to just go out there. So maybe the person threatening blackmail to say, I'm going to come clean, I'm going to be the whistleblower, I'm going to expose the corruption, wasn't just Ben Benick in that part, but maybe it was Christine Schultz as well was going to do that or something. For some reason, she talked about pictures to the polka woman and not wanting to show one for embarrassment or something. So it was about pictures. And then she ends up dead. Well, isn't that coincidental that we have a photographer and we have Ryan acting like 
who's the ex-boyfriend, acting like he's in charge of everything, kind of like Schultz did. And then the person that's making squeaky wheels over here about corruption ends up being framed for it. Kind of creepy how well that uh, tied together, isn't it? Really does kind of make you look at Ryan a second time, third time, fifth time, millionth time. I mean, all, all he's got to do if Ryan wants out from under this is just go talk to Zellner, work with Zellner. All right, guys. I sound a little better. Oh, that's awesome, Bob. Oh, thank you, Jedi Scoobs. Told me to float safely. Appreciate it. I'm just seeing if there's anything we missed. Yeah, they're getting trash on others. Yeah. You know, to save their own asses. Yeah, I mean, really, when you when you think of the Dave Bogotka um, stories he shared, which I've never doubted him. I have a lot of respect for Dave. High respect. I believe he's the first truther out there, the real blood, true blood. Um, he talked about these pictures and this type of behavior in these parties and these boys' clubs. And then we're looking at him in the Ben Bennett case, and uh, we're looking at the same people. And then we've got Teresa taking pictures. I mean, it starts really, she's not the nun that everybody in, you know, King Kratz painted this nun going to the nunnery. We know she's not, and she's taking naked photos. It's got to make you wonder, guys. So leave you with that thought. Love, much love. I'd blow kisses at you, but I don't want to get you sick. Take care. Oh, yeah, we haven't said this in a while. If you didn't do the crime, you shouldn't do the time. Bye, guys.